All right. <clears throat> uh, good evening, everyone. And I want to welcome you to the Greenbelt Resident City Council Candidate Forum. Um, and we are excited to have um, our 10 or possibly nine candidates uh, this evening who are uh, pursuing a role on our city council um, and will uh, be representing us um, in the, the business of uh, what we do in Greenbelt. Um, this is an opportunity for you to learn about the candidates, uh, what they believe in, their approaches, their experience um, and their hopes for the city. Um, we all know that we live in a beautiful city of more than 23,000 people, uh, ranging from uh, children to families to seniors to uh, immigrants uh, and everyone in between. Um, so I want to um, encourage you to, to listen with an, an open uh, mind uh, to what they have to say. Um, this evening, we will go through uh, six questions that came from uh, you as residents. Uh, we received well over 20 questions uh, from residents on a wide range of topics. Of course, in the time that we have, we cannot cover um, the full breadth of the questions that we receive, but we will do our best to cover uh, the topics that seem to be most important to uh, our residents. But this is just the one opportunity. I want to encourage you, if a question wasn't answered uh, this evening, to follow up with the candidates, to ask them uh, what they they think and their thoughts on what's important to you, uh, because your vote is vital. Uh, we all know and we encourage everyone to participate in national and presidential elections, but we all know that city and municipal elections are just as vitally important to us um, as residents. So um, each of the candidates have been uh, briefed on the, the uh, format for this evening. Uh, we will start out with an introduction from each candidate, then move to the six questions and we will have uh, closing remarks from everyone. Um, again, I want to thank you for uh, joining us this evening. I will pass things off to Mr. David Zaron. Thank you, Dina, and welcome everyone to this wonderful forum here. You know, a lot of you probably know these candidates. You've probably run into them at the co-op or maybe saw them in the Labor Day parade. Maybe they're your neighbors. Maybe you read the news review last week when each of the candidates was presented with three questions and they held forth on each one of those. We have six different questions here tonight, but this is your chance to find out even more about these people that wanna represent you, as Dina said, on the council for the next couple of years. Uh, the questions that we have here will be presented to each candidate. They will each get the same six questions. Uh, we'll go in a order that will show you first the uh, order of the ballot, the way, they, the way they are listed on the ballot, they will introduce themselves. They'll have one minute apiece. And then for each of the questions, we'll give them a minute and a half, 90 seconds. And there is a clock on your screen there. And I will do my best. Uh, I don't have a buzzer. I will not be giving you a 10 or a five second warning. I'll let you take your full 90 seconds. And keep in mind that the clock only starts after I have finished asking the question. And I will be happy to repeat the question. I'll do that as a matter of course, as we go through here. All right, so if we are ready, let's get this forum started here and welcome all nine. We have nine of our candidates here tonight. And the first candidate that you're about to meet is Brandon Rick Gordon. Uh, Mr. Gordon, welcome to the program. And would you start us out? You get to go first. Tell us <laughs> about yourself and why you want to be on the council. Thank you so much. My name is Brandon Rick Gordon. I'm a community activist that resides in the Franklin Park community. I am already about the people's business, already working for you, the residents of Greenbelt. I serve on various boards and committees, uh, GATE being one of them, also PRAB as well as the GFC, to name a few. I also sponsored various rallies that have dealt with common ground building here in our city, uh, be it through uh, things so far as community activism and through stopping the violence and voter registration and census awareness. As I go out through our city, I hear people ask, who can I send? I ask you, Greenbelt, send me. Send me to stand for you. Send me to represent you. Send me to advocate for you. I ask for you to send me. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. And next uh, candidate is Rodney Roberts. Mr. Roberts, it's time for you to do your one minute commercial. Tell us about yourself, please. Make sure you're unmuted there so we can hear you. Is Mr. Roberts with us? There he is. Rodney, we, we can see your lips move, but we can't hear what you're saying. How about now? How about now? One more time. Give me a sound now? check. Good. Sounds good. All right. So let me give I you a minute again. You've got one minute, Mr. Back. Roberts. Tell us about yourself, please. I'm Rodney Roberts. I grew up here in Greenbelt. Uh, I'm 63 years old. I've given 35 years out of my 63 years uh, trying to make sure that people that come after me get to enjoy the, the really good things about Greenbelt. A lot of them are you know, the forest or open space or affordability or friendliness, all the things that really uh, set Greenbelt out from, a, from all the other uh, places around us. I think Greenbelt is a special place and I wanna do everything I can to keep it a special place. So thank you, and I, I look forward to the questions tonight. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Our next candidate is Judith Davis, Jay Davis. Ms. Davis, welcome to the program. Tell us, uh, tell us why you want to be on the council. Well, first of all, I'm Jay Davis. Most people know me by that name. I'm number four on the, on the ballot. I moved to Greenbelt in 1975 first renting and then buying my condominium apartment in Greenbrier in Greenbelt East. I'm a retired educator. I was the chair of the advisory planning board and the carnival chair for the Labor Day Festival for many years before being elected to council. During my tenure on council, I was mayor for 16 years, the longest consecutively serving Greenbelt mayor and the third woman in that position. Many changes have occurred in Greenbelt during my 14 terms as council member more development, increased and more diverse population, expanded city services, a forest preserve, as well as many challenges, especially in the past year and a half. And one thing that doesn't change, however, council's purpose is to serve our residents. And I firmly hold that belief and hope that you give me your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. And you indeed are fourth on the ballot. Uh, Mr. Zajac, who is not able to be with us this evening, is number three. So the fifth person on the ballot and the fifth introduction we'll get this evening is from Mr. Matthew Inzio. Mr. Inzio, welcome to the show. Thank you, sir, for having me. Uh, real quick, my name is Matthew Inzio. Um, I moved to Greenbelt at eight years old in my family. Um, the one thing special about me is I feel like I am the candidate for the future. And people ask me why is that? It's because I can represent four different generations of Greenbelters. Uh, to, the, to the young child as eight years old when I lived here, to a teenager in Greenbelt, also to a young adult in Greenbelt, and currently as a father and a, a, a husband and a father of four also living in Greenbelt. So I understand the good, the bad, and the struggle of Greenbelt. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Inzio. Uh, next on the ballot and our next introduction comes from Colin Bird. Mr. Bird, welcome to the show. Tell us about yourself, please, and why you wanna be on the council. Thank you, Mr. Dave, and thank you to everyone uh, for having me. Uh, you know, in this election, which is an important election, uh, there are candidates with a great deal of experience. Uh, there are some candidates who are lifelong grain belters, uh, and there are some candidates with a lot of youth energy and fresh ideas. I, I think I bring the best of all three of those worlds uh, as a lifelong green belter, as somebody who is- Janaya, come here, please. Um, and as somebody Janiah. who has served as a city council member and as mayor for the past uh, two years. But more than that, I'm also somebody who has collaborated, collaborated closely with my colleagues on a number of issues. Uh, from public safety uh, to issues as varied as issues impacting Greenbelt West, like building the trail uh, for Greenbelt Station, the new community, uh, working closely with stakeholders at the state level on issues like that. And so uh, I humbly ask that on November 2nd, you vote Bird, your voice will be heard. Thank you, Mr. Bird. Uh, we move next to Silky Pope. Uh, Ms. Pope, you have one minute. Please tell us about yourself and why you want to be on the council. 
Thank you so much for having us tonight. I really appreciate that you give us the opportunity to have this forum tonight. Uh, so my name is Silky Pope and I have lived in Greenbelt since 1998, 23 years. The longest I've lived in one place ever. <laughs> my husband, my family moved here from Germany after my husband retired from the US military and we needed to relocate to this area for a job opportunity. We lived in Spring Hill Lake uh, first for about four years, and my daughter started her first grade uh, in, in Spring Hill Lake Elementary, actually. Uh, we then decided to stay in this great city and make this our home. Uh, I became a naturalized citizen of this wonderful country in 2006. I have been working for Greenbelt Middle School and Spring Hill Lake Elementary School for 21 years. We are residing in Bell Point in a, a community here in Greenbelt, right behind American Legion. I have two rescue dogs and five grandchildren. And yes, I've served on many, many, um, uh, uh, on many, many uh, boards as well. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Pope. Thank you very much. For I ran out of time. <laughs> all right, we move to the next person on the ballot and our next uh, council candidate, uh, Mr. William. Orleans. Mr. Orleans, uh, I know you're having some difficulty with your Wi-Fi. Are you still with us? I'm with you. Good. All right. Would you take a minute and tell us about yourself, please, and why you want to be on the council? Uh, good evening, all. Uh, I returned to Greenbelt in 2004, and after a short period of uh, medical recovery, started attending council meetings, something uh, I had had done only sporadically when I was living in New York. Meetings were mostly during the day. For most of that time until this time, uh, very few people, residents of Greenbelt attended council meetings. Uh, thankfully that has improved somewhat more recently. Uh, it did not take me very long to uh, think of council as more than uh, just an amusement something that induced anger in me. So then, as it has continued to do, talks too much and listens not enough. Uh, apart from any one policy or any one or more policy decisions council has made, uh, they have a disdain for residents of Greenville. And it's for that reason that I first decided to run to be a candidate in 2007 and when permitted to be Mr. Orlean, so in thank you very much for taking that minute there. To, I'll be able run. to come back to you in just a few moments and maybe you can finish some of those thoughts in answering one of the other questions here. Thank you, sir, very much. Let's move on to uh, Emma Jordan. Uh, Mr. Jordan, welcome to the show tonight. And hey, would you uh, take your one minute, please, sir? Uh, good evening, Dave. Uh, my name is Emmett Jordan, and I'm running for re-election to the Greenbelt City Council. Uh, I've served on council since 2009. I'm currently uh, serving as mayor pro tem after three terms as mayor. And let's see, I've lived in Greenbelt for about 22 years. I relocated here to work with the University of Maryland back in 1998 and moved uh, here to Greenbrier Condominiums. It's, you know, it's a great location and so many amenities in the city of Greenbelt. Uh, in 2009, I became the first African-American elected to serve on the city council in Greenbelt. Uh, I'm a native of Cincinnati, Ohio. I studied liberal arts and music at Morehouse College and at the University of Cincinnati, where I ultimately received a bachelor's of science degree in urban administration. Uh, I, I attend a lot of workshops and conferences to, to make sure that, that I'm up on the latest uh, information for municipalities. I serve on a number of committees, including the Metropolitan Washington Council of Government's Transportation Planning Board and the National League of Cities First Tier Suburbs Council that I actually chair. I've worked with a lot of organizations, including the Smithsonian Institution, the University of Maryland, United Eagle College Fund, but I've been working as an independent contractor for the past. Mr. Jordan, can we, can we uh, uh, hear some more of that in some of your subsequent answers there? So we keep everyone to just one minute. And the last of the candidates, last and certainly not least here, uh, again, we are going by ballot order. The last person on the ballot is Kristen Weaver. And Kristen, uh, Miss Weaver, welcome to the show. Tell us about oh. yourself, why you want to be on the Greenbelt City Council. Yeah, so my name is Kristen Weaver. Uh, I moved to Greenbelt in 2015. I live in Greenbelt Station in Greenbelt West, and we moved to this neighborhood because of the proximity to the metro. But even though it's a new neighborhood, uh, one of the things I love about being part of a, a, his, of a, 
a community like Greenbelt that has such a history as you have the new and the old and all of the wonderful things about Greenbelt as well as the, you know, the modern things like the, the neighborhood that I live in. And when I moved, um, one of the things that was really important to me was to help develop a sense of community within my neighborhood, but then also trying to get more involved in things in Greenbelt. So I um, was one of the original members of the um, uh, of the the activities committee, and then I've sought other opportunities to uh, to sit on the park and recreation advisory board, the connecting across Greenbelt group, composting, all of these things. That it's just really important to me to be active in the community, and I see council as kind of the next step of being more active. And I hope you'll help me uh, help me get there on November second. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you all for adhering to the to the one minute there for your introductions. And let's move on now to the first of our six questions. And we will be going on in the same order, the ballot order for this first question. So uh, Mr. Gordon, you'll be first up. And our first question tonight, you know, even among Greenbelt advocates like yourselves, differences of opinion are inevitable and, and even expected. But the challenge is always how to disagree without being disagreeable. So let's start by asking each of you what you'll do to make the next council a cohesive, collaborative, and productive body. Mr. Gordon. Thank you so much, Mrs. Aaron. I think the answer isn't that, is not that trivial. Uh, common ground, I believe, was the answer for all. Because we have to learn to work together as one. Because it's not about us. It's not about people in council. Yes, we work for our residents, but ultimately it's about the residents and working for them. So what I want to do, I want to interject a way that we can make sure our council meetings are done in decency and in order. Uh, to make sure that we are meeting within a decent time and not uh, fatiguing our residents um, out during the wee hours of the night. Uh, that's what I want to interject into council where we have pre-meetings before our council meetings and we start to talk with each other. Having team building exercises to help build unity amongst council, to go beyond the four walls of the council chambers to build that union because if we're unified, then we can work better for our residents. If we're unified, our residents can see us as an example on how to be productive green bubbles because it begins at the top and then work its way down. So the residents, our children are looking at us and what we do as an example. So I believe that we can do these things. We can make them happen. We have to stand on that common ground of unity together. And that stands by those things by learning to work with each other, talk with each other, having those building exercises to find that way to get things done for Green Belters and not just for ourselves, not for our ambitions, but for Green Belt. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Gordon. And uh, just to remind all of our viewers, each of our candidates will have 90 seconds to answer all of our questions here. Uh, Mr. Gordon answered exactly on 90 seconds. So we appreciate that. We move next to uh, Mr. Roberts. Uh, you heard his introduction a few moments ago. And Mr. Roberts, let me just reiterate, uh, we're asking you and all of your council candidates uh, to tell us what you'll do to make the next council a cohesive and productive and collaborative group. Your thoughts, please. Well, my philosophy is to leave politics out of the city council. Uh, when I, you know, my philosophy is that uh, I vote you know, on the various issues, uh, depending on, you know, what I hear in the community from my, from the people in the community and what I think is ultimately what I think is the best thing for our city. And that's how I vote. And then I allow the citizens uh, to decide, you know, whether they want to reelect me at the end of the two year term, because, and that's what I do. You know, if, if I take a vote and people don't like it and they want to vote me off the council for that, that's their prerogative, but I'm not going to change my votes depending on you know how many votes I might get or I might not get. I think that's one of our big problems right now is we have too much politics in the city council. We need to be uh, you know leaving that behind and doing what we think is right for the community and then allowing the citizens to decide if they agree with us or not. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. We appreciate that. Let's move on now to Jay Davis. Uh, uh, 
Ms. Davis, again, what you will do on council to make it more productive and cohesive in the new term. Thank you. Uh, that indeed has been a problem during the past two years and has been very noticed by our residents. How the council behaves and reacts with each other depends primarily on how the meetings are led and organized. We have standing rules and they need to be followed, enforced, and reinforced if necessary. Periods of discussion can be controlled without limiting full participation by members of council and by our residents. Leadership is key along with a cooperative, collaborative council. All of us are responsible for how the meeting goes on. To regain this collegiality and civility, the new council needs to meet, not in Ocean City or anywhere special, but in a retreat and in that atmosphere soon after the election to review the standing rules and propose ways to improve the meetings. There is, there is a way to do this and we have done this in the past. Very often we do have disagreements, but we don't need to get off track. We need to stick to the business of the city and to the residents and then uphold our own uh, principles of uh, civility while we're doing this. Thank you. Thank you for your suggestions, Ms. Davis. We move next to Mr. Inzio. Mr. Inzio, welcome back. And uh, again, we're responding to a question about the decorum on the board, how you can make the next council a more productive and cohesive group, sir. Please unmute yourself. I think uh, you might have muted yourself there. Sorry, sir. Yes, sir. Go Thank ahead. you. We'll start your clock. Okay, you've got your 90 seconds. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Um, I think the most important thing is teamwork. And what I've done already is, is starting the conversations with, with the council already. And I think that uh, I, I totally agree that a lot of the rules have been broken in the past. And, and, and I also value that. I think rules are important. I think rules should be followed in reference to council. And I think that the value is, is I, I think I'm an excellent, an, an excellent uh, listener. And I value that because when I speak, I think that um, it's, it's important to speak when you have something extremely valued to say. So I'm not with the bickering. I'm not with the back and forth. I wanna make sure that when I say something in council, it's important, it's meaningful and it's direct and it helps the city of Greenville. And thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate those suggestions uh, as do all the voters out there who are listening to all of these responses here. We now go back to Mr. Bird. Mr. Bird, uh, next council, uh, a more cohesive, a more productive body. Any suggestions? Well, thank you for the question. You know, for me, uh, when I first ran for office, I said, vote Bury, your voice will be heard. What that means is that the people always come first. The people always come first. The people always come first. Now, why do I say that in the context of this question? This is an important question, right? There has definitely been tension on council over the past two years. And I would note, it is not necessarily new. We've seen you know, tension on council for years on different issues between different council members. But what I'm even more concerned about is the tension between the people, the needs of the people and the decisions that are made by the city council. It is incredibly important that we find that common ground as was alluded to earlier, but that that common ground not just be between us, but between us and the people that we represent. That is something that I think given that there will be some, at least at least some new council members we will be able to work toward. Um, and I've tried my best to make sure that there's synchrony between myself and the people. And to the extent that that extends to the rest of council, I think we will get to a point where there is less tension. We do need to have team building exercises. Um, I've held more town halls than any council member in city history. And so again, bridging the gaps that exist between the positions, views, and policies espoused by our council and those desired by the people will be critical. Thank you very much, sir, for sharing your thoughts with us. We move now to uh, Ms. Pope. Uh, Ms. Pope, again, your thoughts um, on making this next council a more productive uh, body? Pope. Your thoughts, Thank you. please. Thank you for your question. Um, we definitely need to improve the personal and professional etiquette of our meetings. And as well as our current late night council meetings, they are just unacceptable. And 
um, those long, long running meeting times, they hinder citizens involvement and are just not respectful of anyone's time. I think we need to have clear and manageable meeting agendas that contain a reasonable number of topics and time limits. As it was said before, um, we need to find that um, we need to stick to our meeting rules, um, you know, and not ignoring them and just following them when they're convenient. But I really think we should adhere to our council standing rules as well as Robert's rule of order. Um, I'm for one always willing to work with all of council members um, present and, and new ones, and hopefully I'm, I'm going to be reelected and I'll have the um, a chance to work with, with our new council members who are going to be elected because we have these two uh, free seats, possibly more. Um, but I really think that we need to show a united front. We are leaders of our city and our residents, we work for our residents and they look up to us and they see these disagreements and how would it, and I think, how would it make me feel? Well, it wouldn't make me feel very confident. So we definitely have to make some changes. We have to sit together and we, are ha we have to be all willing to collaborate and work together. Together, we can go far. Thank you so much, Ms. Pope. And uh, thank you and all of the candidates for adhering to the 90 second limit here for each of these questions. We move now to uh, Mr. Orleans. Mr. Orleans, I, I know you had some problems with your Wi-Fi before. Are you back up and running? Make sure you unmute yourself, sir. I'm with you at the moment and I think I'm unmuted. Wonderful. Wonderful. So the question uh, at hand here is uh, your ideas on making the next council uh, a more cohesive and productive body. I'm all for productivity and I'm also all for cohesion uh, on council. Uh, I'm also all for civility. I think we have a misunderstanding uh, in Greenbelt and among candidates and among residents uh, that uh, all argumentation is necessarily a bad thing. Uh, I don't agree that argumentation is necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes, in fact, I believe most often, the best consensus can be arrived at after a contentious discussion. So I'm not opposed to members of council and members of the public when they're permitted to participate in contesting one another on uh, a public, given public policy question. What hinders council, what causes meetings to run late and what causes the tension that we're all opposed to is when council members choose to be defensive when something is said about them or their position. That needs to stop. With the old council or with the new council, members of council should say what they have to say and let it go. Thank you, sir. I appreciate all those suggestions uh, that you've offered to us. Uh, let's go now to Mr. Jordan. And again, uh, productivity, cohesiveness, collaboration, all good words. How do we make all of them come true in the new council? Well, thank you, thank you. You know, I, I think some of the tension on council is really reflective of uh, the tension and divisiveness that we see all across the country right now. So, and I think that plays out in Greenbelt in different ways. Um, you know, sometimes I, I think council takes itself too seriously. You know, we're, we're all neighbors first and we just need to lighten up sometimes and work as a team. You know, it's really not about me or about us. It's about taking care of the business of the city. So as far as the mechanics of how we work, I think we need to have better time management of the meetings. We really do need to stick to the, uh, the rules that we've all agreed to in terms of the cycle of when, how often people speak and how long people speak. So that, that would help quite a bit. A couple of suggestions. I think that uh, you know some uh, sections of the agenda, for instance, uh, petitions and requests. I'm really beginning to think that we could actually record those uh, ahead of time, maybe uh, air them between 7:30 and 8, because too often that section of the agenda turns into a back and forth, questions and answers, and that's not what it's supposed to be. So you know, I think uh, civility is very, very important. I think the team building and retreats and working together, you know, we have to place more of an emphasis on it. But yeah, in general, I think we all need to lighten up a little bit. Thank you so much, Mr. Jordan. And uh, the last uh, speaker in this first question about 
the council and how it might improve the decorum there goes to Ms. Weaver. Ms. Weaver. Thank you. Um, so I think that all of city council could benefit from training and how to lead effective, productive meetings. Uh, there are organizations that provide resources for that, including the Center for Dyna Dynamic Community Governments, which has even received grant funding from the city in the past. Uh, and then the, the the question we were sent asked for a specific example. So I, I have one of those of a, of a time, I think, recently that the process could have improved. And it has to do with the, the recent discussion of police reform. There was the initial the proposal put forward by Mayor Mayor Byrd and then responded to by the Public Safety Advisory Board and the and Chief Bowers, and then several work sessions worth of discussion. But I think the most recent work session could have been used more effectively to determine which points of that proposal there was general agreement on, which I think there were many, and which were going to be sticking points. And that might have meant going through line by line as needed for those issues that were causing concerns either to council members or the police department and find compromises. But I think if that had been done in, a, in an organized way and gone through that, that motion step by step, a motion that had enough votes to be passed in council could have been ready for the next regular meeting rather than it being pushed off again, which is what happened. And um, my initial position on the, that police reform package was that it didn't seem necessary to duplicate regulations which were included in the new state like legislation going into effect next year. But I think listening to some of the thoughtful comments during that session, I'm now pretty convinced that it is an important message for us to send with, that, that, with our process. However, that message is lost if it takes months longer to actually pass something. Thank you very much, Ms. Weaver. And that concludes the answers to our first question. Uh, we'll be moving on to the second question now. And uh, uh, Mr. Gordon, you'll be happy to know that you are not first again. <laughs> Maybe you did like being first. We're going to change the order up, up just a little bit so you all can, uh, yeah, we're going to play musical chairs here a bit. Again, you have 90 seconds and let's move on now to the environment. You know, none of us can escape what's been happening to our planet. Climates are changing, the globe is warming, species are shape-shifting, and as they try to avoid extinction. You know, Greenbelt, and we're all proud of Greenbelt, is already consciously green. But candidates, what specific actions would you take to further reduce our town's carbon footprint? Reducing our town's carbon footprint. And we're gonna start with Mr. Roberts this time. Mr. Roberts, can you share your thoughts with us, please? We're not okay. Can you hear me are now? You with us still? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out this laptop. I'm lost. I, okay, I, what was that I, question? I understand again? your problems. Yes, go ahead. Again? Well, can you give me the question again? I sure can. Uh, what specific actions would you take to further reduce Greenbelt's carbon footprint? This is a question about the environment. Yeah, I think that's an important question. And uh, for one thing, we have to protect all of the trees that we have in our forest. And we need to increase the amount of trees that we have. And that makes a big difference because I think that that's why we have a livable planet in the first place is because of plants that know how to photosynthesize. And then we also have to reduce our use, especially the use of the automobile. I've been fighting this for years and years I served for 28 years on the transportation planning board, and I have always been fighting and fighting against the proposals to have new highways around us, through us, you know, you name it. And if we continue down the road of highways and, and driving more and more cars, regardless of what kind of cars it is, even if we all had an electric car, the fact that we had to make millions and millions of cars every year that's not going to save our planet. So we need to use have less cars on the highway. And I think the pandemic kind of helped us with that. But it seems like we're going back, you know, a lot of people going back to work instead of working at home. So I think we, there really needs to be a concerted effort to have more people stay at home and work. Because I think we, we learned through the pandemic that that is a viable solution. People can a lot of people can work at home. And I think that would make a huge amount of difference. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you so you. much for that answer. Let's move on to uh, Ms. Davis. Uh, tell us about car the carbon footprint. How can we reduce it here in Greenbelt? 
Well, first of all, Greenbelt need, is to be commended for all of the uh, policies and events and activities that we already do. Uh, as a city, and especially with our public works and our recycling department, uh, we have achieved uh, the Sustainable Certified Maryland at least three times now, the last time with over 600 points, which is the most points any city has ever achieved. So there are many things that we, we still can do and improve. Yes, we need to increase uh, the electric number of electric vehicles in our fleet. And we need to also make sure that there are more uh, electric vehicle chargers throughout the city. Uh, we need to look at what we are recycling. We already do quite a bit, but we can also promote it better. A lot of folks just don't know what to recycle. And you have to kind of reinforce it and do it over and over again. And we find new ways to recycle. There are many wooded parcels still in existence throughout Greenbelt. We've already added another parcel to the forest preserve over in Greenbelt East. Uh, but we need some other uh, forest, uh, forest preserve parcels as well, especially perhaps over in Greenbelt West, though they have a whole state preserve over there that really is wonderful. So a lot of the other things we need to look at are, are the gaps in our street trees and then lead, keep uh, putting more street trees in, especially in Greenbelt West, and make sure that they are trees that will be able to survive in our changing climate. Thank you very much, Ms. Davis, for those uh, suggestions. We move now to Mr. Bird and your thoughts on reducing the carbon footprint here in town. Well, let's start with a couple of fun facts. First of all, the first job I ever had was with Environment Maryland. Uh, so from day one, uh, I've been about this. Number two, um, I sit on the Prince George's County Climate Action Commission. Number three, I'm the council liaison to Green Aces. And then number four, my campaign is endorsed by the city's foremost climate activist, and that is Laura Rosenthal. But what do we want to do on this issue? Well, one of the things that has already happened over the past few years, and Councilmember Davis alluded to it, is we are now, you know, before I came to the office, this wasn't the case, but we are now number one in all of Maryland when it comes to sustainable Maryland certification. That's number one. Number two, we passed a, a resolution that I put forward related to declaring a climate emergency in Greenbelt. And number three, I believe that going forward, we must absolutely deal with this fact that we need to stop investing in fossil fuel vehicles and begin the transition in a meaningful and, and with teeth way uh, to vehicle purchases, whether it's tiered from all electric and then plug-in hybrid, then standard, standard hybrid, but we have to move away from internal combustion and expanding our composting is gonna be also critically important. I think we have to set in place very strong, ambitious climate reduction goals as part of our sustainability framework, which needs to be updated. Thank you, Mr. Bird. We appreciate your comments. Let's move on now to uh, Mr. Orleans. Mr. Orleans, uh, reducing the carbon footprint here in Greenbelt. Your ideas, sir. Mr. Orleans, are you still with us? Oh, I'm with you. Uh, I good. apologize. That's all right. Just make sure you uh, uh, let us see your uh, your video. I think you might be well, blocking your that, video. I thought that may actually have been part of the problem, but uh, there's my pretty face. There you go. Uh, all right. In addition, in addition to the council uh, recognizing its responsibility to when making a purchase of vehicles to procure more uh, vehicles that are not uh, of the infernal com combustion variety. And that would be equipment as well. And in addition to uh, hopingly, hoping not to see more of our forest and our uh, Greenbelt woods uh, removed, uh, one important thing the city of Greenbelt could take the lead in is in mobilizing the municipalities in the PGCMA and mobilizing the municipalities in the Maryland Municipal League to do more countywide and statewide. Uh, the procurement con cooperative purchase agreement that Greenbelt falls within 
is very often something that's uh, negotiated at a, at a much higher jurisdictional level. Uh, as to support candidates countywide and statewide that will demonstrate a commitment to reducing our carbon footprint. There's more that we can do. This council needs to be sincere and the next council needs to be sincere in their pursuit of a lesser carbon footprint. Thank you for sharing those thoughts with us, sir. Let's move on now to uh, Ms. Weaver. Yeah, thank you. I think this is a really important issue. And I, I, I agree that the city has, has done many things that we need to keep doing, such as trying to install more solar panels on city buildings or other city possible property where that might be feasible. And, and I think whenever renovations or new construction is taking place on city property, we need to make sure that we're, bu we're building energy efficient buildings. Uh, I think I agree we should also make sure we're only buying electric vehicles for the city fleet and thus there truly are no other viable options. Um, I've also been recently learning a lot more about the push to make new construction all electric, mostly residential construction, meaning no gas for heating or cooking. I think that's something we should advocate for whenever possible because that has implications for not only the carbon footprint, but also indoor air quality and other health issues. Um, I think diverting food scraps from the landfill for composting is a way to re reduce emissions of methane, which is a more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Um, and I've been personally involved with the community composting initiative supported by the city at, at Spring Hill Lake Recreation Center, and was really pleased when the compost drop-off was added at Buddy Attic Park. But I think there is more that we can be, do to encourage composting of food scraps, certainly continuing to promote individual composting or neighborhood projects like the one at Spring Hill Lake, but also even maybe look at a pickup system alongside trash and recycling, including in apartment complexes where people don't have a yard to compost themselves even if they wanted to. Um, so I think also beyond reducing our carbon footprint, we also need to be proactive in our city policies to prepare for the impacts of climate change that we are not going to be able to avoid. Thank you, Ms. Weaver. Uh, Mr. Gordon, you've heard your other candidates talking about reducing the carbon footprint, your ideas, sir. Yes, sir. So with that being said, there are so many great ideas and I commend our city, our city council for taking the steps in order to climb the, the combat climate change and other things. But I will say that, you know, again, it's not very trivial. Sometimes we have to look at, we need to train. Because sometimes, most time, it, it's, you know, most folks don't understand why the need to recycle, uh, the need to compost. And I would want to work with the city council in order that we could work with our different apartment uh, owners and property management owners to make sure that I know, for example, I live in Franklin Park and there is no recycling there. The overflow of trash shows that you do not have that there. So by working with the council to make sure these property managers have recycling in place and there throughout the city also using the Center for Dynamic Governance and other entities like that to help train and we could also have different trainings as far as from complexes throughout different areas of the city, different homes, that, so people can know and understand the importance. Most times it's the fact of people don't know why. You know, I see all these great things, you put these great things up, electric cars, all the stuff is great, but why? So I think we need to educate. And I think education is the biggest part of it. Because once you educate the masses as the importance, you will see behavior change. Then once you see behavior change, then you will see our carbon footprint begin to change as well. There's an old saying, the day we cease to change is the day we cease to grow. And the day we cease to grow is the day we begin to fall. So we need to change our mode of thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. We appreciate you sharing those suggestions with us. We now move to Mr. Enzio. Uh, Mr. Enzio, your thoughts on carbon footprint reduction. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, yes. My plan and is also to really just to be a good teammate, uh, to be to work well with council in reference to uh, pushing this further. Uh, the things that I would like to do is one to to set up a plan to build to 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 plant more trees. I think that's very valuable and very very important. Another thing is to try to encourage other options than just driving. Um, I think that we should invest more more money in in uh, better coming up with a biking lane and encourage biking, encourage walking, and encourage public transportation. And, and I think that's very valuable. Uh, I think I would definitely be encouraged to moving into all electric and all hybrid vehicles. Another thing that I've seen is, is that people are putting charging dockets in front, of their, in front of their houses. And I think that we should encourage that and we should promote that. 
uh, also for future developments with the apartments. I think we should encourage also solar panels and really look into environmentally friendly uh, um, options. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your ideas, Mr. Incio. Uh, we have two candidates left. Next is Ms. Pope. Ms. Pope, uh, share your ideas, please, on reducing Greenbelt's carbon footprint. Thank you. Our goal should always be reducing energy consumption and increasing the use of sustainable products throughout our city. The city is already nationally recognized as a Maryland certified sustainable city. We must maintain and improve on this accomplishment. We have multiple charging stations for electric vehicles and have recently added a bike share program. The city has electric and hybrid vehicles and is buying wind generated electricity. We must continue to maintain all these accomplishments and to pursue new ways to increase all of these efforts. I would like to replace gas powered vehicles with electric or hybrid vehicles whenever feasible. All lighting should be converted to LED wherever possible. Even using smart power strips in our offices can make a difference and help conserve energy. I would love to see a city owned solar farm to generate power for the city if we could solve the problem of where to locate it. I always support public transportation except the maglev train as much as possible in whatever form that may take. As a city, we must constantly be aware of new developments and more affordable technology, ener technologies, energy conservation methods and sustainability. The city has made a lot of progress and we are known to be a forward thinking city. Let's keep it that way. I also oppose the widening of the DC Beltway. The widening is being proposed as a solution to alleviate traffic, but it's just a pretext to allowing high density residential and commercial development to pursue in our region. Once high density development has been achieved, the traffic on the widened beltway will be right back where we started. Thank you, Ms. Pope. Mr. Jordan, the last uh, word. Thank you, thank you. Words. So, uh, you know, lots of work uh, to improve the uh, city's carbon footprint. That, you know, we've been, the city has been uh, a leader in that area. Lots of work has been done. Uh, so, you know, the credit needs to go to our citizen activists and to uh, councils over past years. Uh, we, we, have done quite a bit, need to do more. Uh, we've done a lot to improve the uh, efficiency of uh, our buildings through, through grants and investments, but we need to uh, move ahead with more solar panels on buildings. It would be nice to actually participate in or to have our own uh, solar farm to, to offset some of our electricity use. I, I think the city can actually do more to, uh, to work directly with our homeowners associations and condo associations and the cooperative and apartment management companies. I think a lot of people uh, would, more people might really compost, you know, if, if they had detailed instructions, better instructions, like postings in, in trash rooms and in some of our common buildings, uh, that would help a lot, flyers. And, and I'm hoping that staff can kind of do a little bit more of that. I think, I think we could do more of that. Around transportation, I think that's a big uh, piece of this formula. And, uh, you know, a city circulator bus is something that we've talked about, something that I've advocated for for a long time. But, you know, during the, the pandemic, uh, you see a lot more people walking and biking. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, first step is for us all to take personal responsibility for our carbon footprints. And uh, I think I may have one of the lowest carbon footprints of anybody on the uh, screen tonight. So thank I'm you. Proud. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. Jordan for uh, uh, sharing all of that with us. Uh, uh, we'll be moving on to question number three. Those of you that are just joining us, this is the forum for the Greenbelt City Council. We have nine candidates who are holding forth on six questions. We've talked about decorum on the council. We've talked a little bit now about uh, carbon footprints, uh, about the environment. We move now next to uh, accessibility of housing here in Greenbelt. You know, our next question is about that. Um, you know, if a prospective resident is looking for a first home or a moderately priced home, or perhaps one with a higher price tag, what are the options here in Greenbelt? And how about people of a certain age looking for senior housing? What's available for them? With the Beltway Plaza site, for example, being eyed for housing development, what would be your approach to ensuring all those varied options we just listed will exist? Let's start with uh, Ms. Weaver. 
Yeah, so I think we need to continue to push developers to include a variety of housing options. Uh, for Beltway Plaza, I believe senior housing was at one point part of the developer's proposal, but then it got shifted back to being suggested as a hotel. So we need to continue to use whatever leverage we can to sway them back towards that original idea. Um, I think having a mix of rental units and for purchase condos is another suggestion that came up in one of the public feedback sessions Beltway Plaza held. But it's, it's really going to come down to whatever power of persuasion we have, given that the city doesn't have final say on approval of site plans and zoning. Um, we have been able to get other concessions from developers, such as the 27,000 square feet of indoor recreation space that's to be given to the city um, as part of that mall redevelopment. So I think there is some hope of being persuasive, but we, uh, we just have to stay vigilant and keep pushing. And like I said, use whatever leverage and power of persuasion we can, we can muster. Thank, thank you, Ms. You. Weaver. We appreciate that. Uh, let's go back now to Mr. Orleans. Mr. Orleans, we're talking about uh, housing accessibility here, uh, the provision of different levels of housing, entry level up through senior living. Uh, your thoughts, please, on how we approach, uh, how we- I'm, gl I'm glad that we Are you still with us, sir? Mr. Orleans, let's, we, we will cycle back to you. Why don't you work a bit on your uh, on your uh, computer, your laptop there, and we'll come back to you. Let's go now then to Mr. Bird. Mr. Bird, uh, if you would please give us your thoughts on uh, ensuring varied housing options here in Greenbelt. So, so first, let me just uh, make a distinction between aspirational comments on this and getting things done. I, I'll tell you, when it comes to housing, that has been a, a top priority of mine over the past two years, and it'll be, it'll continue to be a top priority of mine uh, for the next two years if I'm fortunate enough to be uh, reelected to the city council. Um, I know, you know, a lot of times when we think of housing, we're just thinking of single family homes in the traditional, but I've I've worked very tirelessly to protect those who um, are renters, or who are tenants. And again, very tangible, practical implications of that. Um, passing legislation to ban rent increases during this pandemic, passing, introducing and passing legislation to ban late fees, and also introducing and falling one vote short on an eviction moratorium. And on top of that, um, working collaboratively with my colleagues, but also with an extraordinary sense of urgency around the need to use the aid that we are receiving and have received from the federal government to provide more assistance uh, when it comes to both mortgages, rental assistance, HOA fees, co-op fees, all of the above. Those have been top priorities. But going forward, really, I'm looking at senior uh, property tax credits for senior citizens and also tying some of the attracting young homeowners in with the last question, because a lot of young homeowners are looking for electric vehicle infrastructure, looking for incentives to put solar on their roofs. I actually sponsored and passed a proposal to put so the, to contribute to the raise on the roof campaign for the co-op supermarket. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bird. We appreciate that. Uh, all those suggestions. Let's move now to uh, Ms. Davis. Ms. Davis, the housing accessibility question. Well, Greenbelt faces two big barriers to making sure that we have adequate and appropriate affordable housing. One, we live in a metropolitan area where the market prices are exceedingly high, rental and house. Now, if you're selling your house, that's great. But if you're trying to buy a house or rent, you're, you're in serious trouble because of that. Uh, now that people are moving out of the city into the inner and outer suburbs, uh, the prices are just going, they're skyrocketing. Um, another issue is the fact that Greenbelt does not have planning and zoning authority. Now we are lucky that we have enough clout, political clout that the developers do come to us and we negotiate and we negotiate as best we can, but very often we are outvoted by the district council or by the county planning board and we take them to court and we still lose. Uh, so therefore we do the best we can trying to get amenities and improvements in any plan but it still means that we are short, especially in senior housing and affordable housing. Senior housing is very important right now because a lot of our seniors in Greenbelt would love to sell their homes and move to a better place. And this would free up some of our affordable housing for the younger families to move in. 
So that's something that we definitely are looking forward to and we have been doing that over the years. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing all that with us. We move now to uh, Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts, our housing question to you. Okay, am I unmuted? <laughs> Uh, you're 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 okay, fine. We you. can hear you now. Thank you. I appreciate it. How you know housing affordability? I think is is the main uh, issue because the you know, really the only reason that I'm still living in Greenbelt is because when I turned you know was I when I was in my middle twenties, I it was time for me to move out of a an apartment, and I wanted to buy a, a home in Greenbelt. The only home that I could afford was a, uh, a GHI frame home. And I love that frame home. In fact, I grew up in a frame home and I'm still living in a, a frame home. But it was a very affordable place. And not only is it affordable, but it's in a, you know, it provides you with a wonderful community because it's not people on top of people. You have open space, you have a yard that you can go out and have a little garden or enjoy your trees, plant trees, you know, whatever you like to do outside. And I think that's really important for a quality of life is, is being able to get outside and enjoy, you know, the outdoors and not be stuck in an apartment all the time. So in order, you know, and the big problem with that is that I think our society in general uh, sees housing simply as a commodity. And as the older I get, the more I think that uh, housing should not be a commodity. Housing should be a right. Uh, and, and our society is not seeing that. And so right now, that's why you see, uh, you know, people that do have money that live in the city, they want to get out in the city. So they're coming out to the, the suburbs and they are Thank you. Thank uh, driving you the price up on everything. We and, appreciate uh, that, sir. Thank you for sharing all that with us, Mr. You. Roberts. Let's move on to uh, Mr. Jordan. And we're talking about uh, housing options, availability, accessibility. Your thoughts, sir. Hey, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. You know, uh, Greenbelt, we're, we're very fortunate. There's, there's a, a great balance. We've got a, a wide variety of housing types, single family homes, townhouses, garden style condominiums, co-ops, apartments. Uh, the, the fact is there's very little uh, undeveloped space in Greenbelt other than around the metro station and our retail hubs like uh, Beltway Plaza and Greenway Center. So, uh, you know, maintaining the housing stock that we have is really the best way for us to maintain affordability. You know, if, if we take care of the property that we have, uh, the structures that we have as, as new apartments or homes are built, uh, it, we still, we're, we're actually, retaining that affordable housing. So it's really, really important that we take care of what we have. But that, that brings up another problem. And it's really a big problem in Greenbelt is, you know, a, a lot of our, uh, our condos and townhouses are aging and in the cooperative as well. So as structures age, uh, maintenance becomes more and more expensive. So what, what we're seeing is, is a real, uh, almost a crisis coming where our, our uh, condo fees and uh, co-op fees are so high, it, it makes it hard for, for people to, to actually continue living where they live. So it, it's not an easy problem to grapple with. Council just needs to spend more time and really discipline itself to uh, grapple with these regional issues. They're not superficial gestures don't really make that much of a difference. It's a complicated problem, we need to, to work Thank on you. it. Thank you very much, Mr. Jordan. Uh, Ms. Pope, you are up next and uh, could you give us your thoughts? on the housing situation? Yes, so first we must remember that Greenville does not have zoning rights. So all decisions are basically made by the county planning board. Um, I also think we, it is very important and very vital to us that we maintain good working relationships with, with the developers who are coming in. Um, and so our concerns and ideas can be incorporated into the new developments. That is very important. We must work together because we cannot say, no, you cannot do this. But I think we can gear it and we can guide it in directions and our voices can be heard on what we need, what our needs are for our community. And our needs are um, uh, subsidized housing. And I would think that the idea of having inclusionary zoning laws like some of the surrounding um, uh, counties have 
would be a good idea. Uh, inclusionary zoning law means that if, uh, developers are required to set aside 12 to 15% of new homes to at below market rates and allow the public housing authority to purchase a portion of these units. And I believe that that would be very helpful. I've seen this done in other places, it works. And these units could be available for seniors, um, people with limited income and families. Uh, I also th hope that one of the, one of the uh, developers did listen to us and I truly look forward to seeing a age restricted apartments coming up soon, hopefully. Thank you, Thank you very uh, much. Exactly Thank you very much. We appreciate that. And we go now to Mr. Inzio. Mr. Inzio, could you uh, share please your ideas on the housing situation here in Greenbelt? Yes, sir. While working on the advisory planning board, I learned a lot about the new developments. Um, and currently there's a lot of new developments. And one thing I have noticed and learned is that the, these developers, they are very willing to work with us. And I think that we need to, to be open, to be forward and to be open-minded and, and to push for what Greenbelt needs. And one thing that I have learned is with the new developments that are coming up, they're, 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 I'm very excited to, to, to work with a uh, senior only uh, facility, condos, and, and then also for the first home time buyers, I see a lot of one bedroom and two bedroom apartments. And I know that's not appealing for most people, but always getting started like what I did and what I've seen a lot of people is the apartments is the first, first step to, to home ownership. And, and that's one thing that I, in the new development, there's a lot of new development, there's a lot of one bedroom and two bedroom units. And I think that'd be great for people to move to Greenbelt, to, to learn about Greenbelt and to branch out into uh, bigger developments uh, and, or townhouses or houses. Thank you, sir. We appreciate you sharing all that with us, Mr. Inzio. Uh, Mr. Gordon, Mr. Gordon, yes, uh, yes. could you please share with us your thoughts on the housing situation here in Greenbelt? Yes, well, there's been many things said, obviously, as we do know, uh, we do not have a uh, zoning authority. But that's a fight I will not give up. I continue to, I think that if I work with council, that we continue to advocate and push me one day, Greenbelt will have that. Well, that being said, I know that we talked about the Beltway Plaza uh, redevelopment as a part of that question. And, you know, I can speak to this because just like many members of council, um, I am vice chair of the operation advisory board. So I actually have seen the different variations of this. And obviously I was a part of that, that same core group the four, four additional amenities uh, that came along. Obviously the senior housing, we would love to have had that, uh, but we did get more recreation spaces in place. So I am proud that we're able to stay on our ground and get that and to stand with PRAB to get that done for the residents. I believe too, it's about education as well. I believe that, you know, we, most folks want to home. Most folks want to do that. Most folks, just to understand the process, want to learn. And I think us as a city, we can continue to utilize our resources to help educate our residents about home affordability and options they can have available to them. And also utilizing our county to help us do that as well. And that's where relationships are also good. Relationships that I'm glad that I do have and work with council to use their relationships. That way we can be good deal makers and also encourage those developers to do right by our residents to make sure we have affordable housing. That's what we must have a firm hand with a soft touch. Council must have a firm hand with a soft touch. We must hold the line and make sure that they are doing right by our residents and make sure they're doing right by our seniors most and foremost here in Greenbelt. Thank you very much, Mr. Gordon. And let's cycle back to Mr. Orleans. Uh, uh, Mr. Orleans, I understand you're having some problems with your video, but you're, you're calling in. So if we can hear your thoughts, we'd like to hear what you have to say about housing accessibility here in Greenbelt. Thank you. I am calling in. Uh, the city does not have zoning authority, but each per prospective developer that wants to build here uh, seeks the city's endorsement on any of its projects. As was pointed out recently, uh, in the last 15 years, three housing developments have uh, either been built or are under construction. And last week, the council endorsed a fourth, uh, previously alluded to uh, senior directed condos uh, at the old nursing home site. Uh, the city has never pressed as it could have the developers to include an affordable element in any of these projects. Uh, specifically, the nursing home site, their price point is from the low, mid, low to mid 300,000s. 
that's not an affordable price for a two-bedroom apartment. Uh, Yet the city endorsed it. Uh, The city council endorsed it. The city council has to have more resolve in the future when it's negotiating, dealing with developers. And while the the city does not have zoning authority, again, if this municipality uh, was mobilized with other municipalities, uh, Greenbelt would have more effect when it goes to Marlboro to uh, testify before the county planning board. Thank you very much, Mr. Orleans. We're glad you were able to make that connection and join us. And uh, candidates, we are at the halfway point of our forum here tonight. We'll have three more questions. Uh, And uh, I think I'm speaking for everyone out there who's watching. I appreciate your adherence to our time cues. I appreciate your stamina and I appreciate your eloquence. So let's keep it up in the second half and uh, continue to give our voters uh, a very good look at what all of you stand for as we approach this next election. Let's go to question number four. Uh, Our next question is one that currently has national attention. The country's crumbling and often inadequate infrastructure. We all know the Greenbelt continues to grow and strain at the seams with our local schools at or above 115% capacity and new housing projects underway like Greenbelt Station and that new apartment complex near the federal courthouse. The need is there for our infrastructure to keep pace with that new housing and consequently more school age youngsters. The question, how can you and the council influence planning for our anticipated infrastructural needs and ultimately reduce overcrowding in our schools? Uh, First up to answer that question is Mr. Jordan. Mr. Jordan, if if you could join us please and talk about infrastructure and overcrowded schools and uh, planning here in the the community. Thank you, that's a very broad question. So as far as the infrastructure goes, you know, 1937, the Greenbelt legacy, uh, we've got more buildings and more infrastructure than most other municipalities our size, which means, you know, the burden or the responsibility for taking care of that uh, is, is greater than for most other municipalities our size. You know, we, we've, uh, council has, has actually done an assessment uh, to actually look at our capital needs going forward. And that's, that's a high priority. If, if you kind of look at where we are and where we're going to be down the line in terms of maintenance on m- infrastructure, it's, it's, uh, it's daunting. So it's something that we need to uh, prepare for by having uh, more reserves. Uh, the question of education, you know, we don't really, con- we don't control the schools, the county controls the schools. Uh, so I, I think the way that the city has influence is, is through the relationships, encouraging better relationships and maintaining the ones that we have with the principals, the PTAs, the school board and the school administration. Uh, you know, we, we have a, an advisory committee on education and they're very, very effective. Uh, so we, we're sort of left uh, through advocacy, but we do have good relationships with the schools. Uh, when new developments are built, we need to find a way to hold developers responsible for contributing towards the schools. Uh, you know, this, that was a very broad question, and I really don't think that uh, 90 seconds is, is enough time to really adequately address uh, the full scope of the question that you asked. But I appreciate it. Love to talk to you more about it. Very good. All right, let's move on to Ms. Pope. And Ms. Pope, we're talking about uh, influence, what the council's influence could be, might be when it comes to infrastructure and uh, somehow reducing the overcrowding in our schools. Right. So I am very concerned about our schools being overcrowded. Um, I work myself at Spring Hill Lake Elementary School, which we are always running on, on overload. Um, the schools are being over capacity, especially when the new housing developed projects uh, have yet to be built. Um, I, I, for one, will continue to ask for our aging uh, Spring Hill Lake Elementary School to be replaced by a bigger and new school. Um, we are always operating with, operating with overcrowded classrooms. That is, that's nothing new. The time is now to replace the school. I believe that in most instances, students should go to schools in their neighborhood for convenience, safety, and building a sense of community. I will be fighting county level efforts to relocate Greenbelt children to other schools outside of Greenbelt, especially when those efforts are being led by architecture and urban planning firms from New York City. So um, I think it's very important for our students to go to their neighborhood schools. That is is a given. 
Um, there has to be a solution that developers who come in and build apartments or condos or whatever it may be, that they have to contribute to our schools more. And I would say they should contribute to the local schools, especially if you come into our community and not just to, to the county, and then they use the money as they say fit at, at some other place. I think they, the money should stay here. The developer has to put something in that pot for schools, for local schools. So our students in Greenbelt can go to Greenbelt schools. Thank you very much, Ms. Pope. Let's talk to Mr. Inzio and Mr. Inzio uh, again. Council's influence on infrastructure and perhaps trying to reduce overcrowding in schools. Yes, sir. One thing that I've noticed is when I moved to Greenbelt, I went to Greenbelt, a Greenbelt Elementary School. And now I have four children. And one thing that I've noticed, and, and Magnolia is, an, ex, is an, an excellent school. But one thing that I loved about Greenbelt and I cherished was Greenbelt Elementary School. And it said that my kids don't go to school in the city that they live in. So my long-term goal would be on council is to work with the school board and work with the county and having um, the county build a new elementary school in Greenbelt. Um, that is one of my long-term goals in Greenbelt. And one thing I learned about anything at Greenbelt, everything is a long-term goal. So that is one of my long-term goals. The second thing with infrastructure I've noticed is that our fire department, we need a new fire department house. Uh, one thing, another long-term goal of mine is for the fire department to have a new facility in Greenbelt, something that's state-of-the-art. And I know that we, we, we're gonna need help with the county and we should, and this is something that they need. And this is something that I would push and I would work with council uh, moving forward. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your thoughts, Mr. Enzio. We move now to Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon, your thoughts, please. Thank you, Mrs. Aaron. So I think it boils down to relationships. Um, I myself, uh, when it comes to schools, I believe that, that is tantamount to the future of the city. Now, obviously, we have developments that are coming in. We have growth in our city, but I think we also need to slow, not stop, but slow development until we get our school situation under wraps. Because the more we move people in, obviously, we're going to bring kids, and we're going to have more overcrowding. And that's when we need relationships, because that's why I'm proud that this campaign is supported by four members of our school board. So I feel like I bring those relationships to the council that way we can help grow and build on those relationships. Because even though we do not have uh, the control of our schools, but it's our job is to advocate. Our job is to go before the actual county and say, hey, this is what our residents need. Again, a firm hand with a soft touch. Even when it comes to those who are above us in the county, we can still go before them and advocate for our residents. So I believe those relationships are a big key to that. That way we can have the new facilities for our students, have the resources for our teachers to do their job to the best of their ability. And that's educating the young minds, the future of the city, to make sure that we do not have to move any students outside of city lines. They can stay here and continue to go to Greenbelt schools because that's what's gonna happen the more we expand and grow because what's gonna happen, you're gonna have no way to go. So we want to keep our students here in Greenbelt. I believe relationships are the key. Thank you. Thank you very much for those thoughts, Mr. Gordon. We move now to uh, Ms. Weaver. Ms. Weaver, uh, we're talking about uh, infrastructure and schools and overcrowding. Would you weigh in for us, please? Sure. Yeah. No, I think I think in this our. our only recourse really is to make the case to the, the Board of Education to plan ahead, you know, these new developments that are coming and the new population that is coming with them. Uh, I think it's actually one of the most challenging things about a city like Greenbelt, which is part of this really complicated network of jurisdictions, because it does have to depend on relationships and working with other people because we don't get to decide things. We can influence things, but we don't have the final say on a lot of things. So it really does become a very difficult issue, which is not a very satisfying answer. Um, and I know I feel for the educators like Ms. Pope, I was in, in my previous life, I was a middle school science teacher before my current job. And my last year of teaching, I do remember trying to fit 35, 35 eighth graders in a science classroom and trying to find, you know, comfortable room for them, let alone doing uh, hands-on lab activities. So it is really a challenging issue. I, I will say though, that while we may not be able to directly influence the schools, I think part of the other question that was, that we were sent had to do with things that we actually 
do have a little bit more control over things like some of the after school programming things that we can support and some of the, the summer activities and, and after school programming that the recreation department already does an excellent job of, but maybe there are some more things that we can help with in that. And there are some, I know some city recognition groups that have done mentoring and other things, continuing to sort, support some of those out of school activities that we do really have more control over, even if we can't, can't force them to build us a new school. Thank you, Ms. Weaver. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bird, uh, your thoughts on how the council can influence infrastructure projects, uh, school buildings, overcrowding. The floor is yours. So as was acknowledged earlier, it's a lot to pack into one question, um, but I'm going to try my best. You know, one of the most recent things that I did, because again, I want to, some of the conversation is aspirational, but I want to connect the aspirational to what has already been done as well. I, I'm so grateful that we were able to work with uh, outgoing council member Lita Mack when I first got on the city council to allow Greenbelt Station residents, children to go to Greenbelt Elementary before they were going to another school and that was putting them on the track not to end up at Eleanor Roosevelt High. So that is one big thing. But one of the consequences, of course, is that further contributed to overcrowding at that school. Now, Councilmember Pope made an important point that even at Spring Hill Lake Elementary, there's also that issue. So I do think what Mr. Gordon said earlier, relationships are important. I'm also supported by four members of the school board. I'm also supported by the current chair of the House Ways and Means Education Subcommittee, Delegate Alonzo Washington. And that is somebody with whom I've worked on infrastructure issues, including the Greenbow Road uh, issues. You know, there's several issues on that road, and I don't need to get into all of them right here. I agree that, you know, we need to have that firehouse. We need to get the armory for the firehouse. But we also uh, were able to work over the past couple of years to save Robert Goddard because Greenbelt students were going to be pushed out of Robert Goddard. And so that's another thing we did to try to address school capacity issues at a school just outside of Greenbelt that a lot of Greenbelt just go to. Thank you very much, Mr. Bird. Uh, let's go now to uh, Mr. Orleans. Uh, Mr. Orleans, uh, I know you joined us by phone before. Are you still there, sir? Mr. Orleans. Here, can you hear me? Yes, I can, sir. Yes, we're talking about infrastructure and the council's influence on infrastructure and on school construction and trying to reduce overcrowding in schools. Your thoughts, sir? I got, I got you. Uh, uh, as has been pointed out, uh, Greenbelt uh, does not control the schools within its jurisdiction. Uh, Greenbelt has had relationships in the past, our city council, with the county council, and it's had relationships in the past with the county executive, the previous county executive of which was elected on a promise to uh, have an all elected school board and within two years reneged on that promise and got the state legislature to enable a hybrid school board controlled effectively by the ex executive. Uh, uh, we obviously don't, don't control the county council, but the count, our Greenbelt City Council has had relationships with Todd Turner and Ingrid Turner before him. And for many years, the county council, when sitting as district council, when it approves new development, uh, does so waiving the adequate public facility fees, public safety, and also schools. Uh, we really have to, uh, we, the people, the residents of Greenville and the residents of the county really have to uh, uh, overcome this disconnect between the people we elect and what they say they're going to do and what in reality they do do. Uh, again, Greenbelt, with other municipalities in Prince George's County through the PGCMA should make it clear to the county council and make it clear to the county executive and make it clear to the school board that we, with any new development, comes the responsibility for providing for adequate. Thank you, uh, Thank you Mr. Orleans, for your thoughts on that. And we will uh, check back with you again on uh, question number five. Let's now go to uh, Ms. Davis. Ms. Davis, your thoughts on this? Overcrowding in our schools is not just a Greenbelt problem. All of Northern Prince George's County has overcrowding. Uh, we do have two parcels of land that are set aside for new schools. They're all in Greenbelt East, however. 
Uh, one of them could be a new middle school, which could help uh, the overcrowding with Greenbelt uh, Middle School. But generally speaking, the, the fact is that we have very little space to put schools where they are most needed. Um, the Eleanor Roosevelt High School is overcrowded because everybody wants to go to Eleanor Roosevelt High School. It's an excellent school. So that is something where we can certainly advocate for the expansion of Eleanor Roosevelt High School, which was planned several years ago, but has been put on hold. We do need a better re relationships with our school board. Right now, they've got their issues. We definitely need to uh, advocate for a new Spring Hill Lake Elementary School. That is by far should have been done many years ago. We should keep our Greenbelt students in Greenbelt if they wish, but it does mean that we're going to have to provide a lot of other services, perhaps after school, as we do with our recreation department and a lot of other organizations. As far as other infrastructure, we not only have brick and mortar infrastructure that we need to maintain, and we are doing the best we can with that, it's the green infrastructure that we also need to make sure that we are helping uh, the parks, playgrounds, our forests, because that's just as important as the brick and mortar. Thank you for all of those thoughts, uh, Ms. Davis. And Mr. Roberts, you get the last word. Thank you, I appreciate it. You know, everyone on the, all of my colleagues on the council like to complain that we don't have our planning and own planning and zoning authority. And that's because none of them are willing to fight to get that authority. There's a little town up in Montgomery County called Washington Grove. It's a fraction on the size of Greenbelt. They have their own planning and zoning authority. Uh, I voted against the massive uh, 2,500 apartment complex at Beltway Plaza, mostly because there's not gonna be a school provided with that development. And not only is it gonna over burden our schools, but it's going to overwhelm all of the services that we have. Our recreation, the 2,700 square feet of recreation space they offered is a joke. That, that's not going to any, come anywhere close to what we need for a development that size. So in, in my opinion, we need to fight to have our own planning and zoning authority because we're being discriminated against. Prince George's County is the only county in the state and pretty much in the country where municipalities do not have their own planning and zoning authority. And we need to fight to get that, even if we need to go to court to get it. And I think that if we do mount a fight and we do go to court, we can, we can do that. We can get our own planning and zoning authority, but you have to have a city council that's willing to take on that fight. And right now, I don't see that happening. Thank you very much, sir. As we end a discussion of question number four, we're about to move on to question number five. Uh, 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 thank you, a shout out to our interpreters for doing such a wonderful job thus far. Please keep it up. We do appreciate all that you're doing here. Let's go on to question five, candidates. Uh, let's move next to finances and economic development. Greenbelt's major shopping centers and indeed the entire business community have all been impacted by the pandemic. Our question is, how do we address the rise in office vacancies? How do we lure back businesses that have closed? And how do we create an environment where new businesses want to set up shop? How do we do all those things? Let's hear from uh, Mr. Bird first. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, this is, this is a complicated issue. It, it, it requires a long range solution. Um, one of the things that I'll push for is the, and, and I've done this alongside, um, and I'll give credit to a council member, Polk, who has long pushed for this, and that is the establishment of an economic development advisory committee. We have a number of citizen advisory committees that um, are, that, that review development proposals that come in. I think we also need a citizen advisory committee that is proactive about dealing with the economic development challenges facing our existing business community and facing those businesses who's who might ultimately consider relocating to Greenbelt or doing business in Greenbelt for the first time. Um, so I think that that is a big thing. Um, working closely with our business uh, community through the forthcoming business alliance will be important. Um, but short of that, again, always trying to make sure we're not just talking about the aspirational, but talking about what has already been done. We have, you know, I, I, I put forward a proposal and I introduced and together with my colleagues passed the first tranche of funding to assist a lot of our businesses that had been impacted, devastated by this pandemic, as you mentioned earlier, 
That's a lot of small businesses like the New Deal Cafe, like a number of other businesses. Uh, we need to do more of that. We need to expand upon that. We need to do that without delay. I have that sense of urgency. I have a commitment to making sure our business community thrives. Um, and, and, and that is critically important. We also need to clean up our shopping centers like Greenway Shopping Center and force the code because they're breaking the code too Thank often. You. Too much Thank you, late. Mr. Bird. Thank you very much for all of that. Appreciate all of those thoughts. Let's move next to Mr. Inzio. Mr. Inzio, we're talking about a business plan. Uh, how do we lure businesses here to Greenbelt? Get people to come back who might have gone. Yes, sir. I think the number one thing I've, I've always noticed that a lot of people in Greenbelt and, and a lot of uh, council members, they we are part of a lot of different committees and groups. Um, one thing that I would push for is to be a part of the Prince George County Chambers of Commerce. And the reason why I say that is because it doesn't matter how many studies you do or how many estimates you do, you need to hear from the businesses. And I would go to the committees, hear from the businesses firsthand, hear exactly what their struggles are, hear exactly what their problems are, and then listen to their advice for us to come up with a positive solution. And there are plenty different committees in that chamber. There's a finance, there's environmental, there's a lot of, and these are successful business owners. I think that if, if, if we ever want to become pro-business in Greenbelt, we need to listen to the actual business owners and joining this commerce is, is the, the right step and to really listen to these business owners. And then they will help us really get us to listen to their problems and we can actually come together as a group and come up with solutions based on their problems and their advice. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Inzio, for sharing your thoughts. Let's now go to uh, Ms. Davis. Ms. Davis, could you weigh in, please? Sure. Um, it's taken us a while as a council to realize that, yes, we take care of our residents, we take care of our youth, our seniors, but somehow we've for forgotten to deal with our businesses. Uh, we, we finally did go ahead and develop an economic development department. We have one person who is doing a phenomenal job of working with our businesses, informing them of, of the assist, financial assistance. And, and we have our business coffees where we do get a chance to talk with our small businesses mostly. But what we probably need to do very soon is to expand that department. Uh, we are going to add an intern to help her out but I think we probably have to have maybe some part-time or even full-time employees in the future. The business alliance idea is a great idea because that's like a green belt chamber of commerce. And right now there's little mini uh, commerces over at Beltway Plaza and Roosevelt Center, but they all need to get together to work together. Marketing would be something that we could also do as a city with our IT department and public relations. Many cities produce videos that they put out in various ways through social media that kind of uh, talk about the attractiveness of the city to bring business in. And most importantly, we need to talk with our current businesses to make sure whatever they need, we give them assistance so that they stay here in Greenbelt. The small businesses and the nonprofits are the small uh, groups of people that work together. We need to keep them as well. Thank you very much, Ms. Davis. Let's go to uh, Ms. Pope. Uh, we're talking business plans and hope for businesses here in Greenbelt. Would you please share your thoughts? Did you unmute yourself there? I'm Mr. so sorry. I had a, there was a computer glitch. That's all right. Did you need me to repeat anything for you? No, no, I'm good. Thank you very much. I'm so sorry. Um, the Greenbelt City Council needs to support and monitor the progress of our economic development. We have multiple high-end office parks that are situated in key geographic positions along convenient major roadways among a variety of government and academic organizations, including but not limited to NASA, BARC, and the University of Maryland. We need to capitalize on these prime office locations by aggressively courting potential federal, state, and county clients and openly communicate with building management. Ms. Lickens, our economic development coordinator could be the liaison between these building developments and the city. We may need to expand the economic development depart department of the city as this is more than a one person job. I also have been advocating for an economic development advisory board whose focus would be to look at ways to connect prospective businesses to our city 
and encourage entrepreneurship to help fill empty business spaces. And of course, we always have to foster uh, our uh, existing businesses throughout the city. And I think Ms. Liggins has done a really good job, especially during um, these terrible times during COVID. Uh, she has done a lot of outreach. She has, and we finally have a uh, inventory of businesses, which we, we didn't have before. Uh, we really didn't know who's in the city, what businesses do we have? And we're getting there slowly but surely, but um, we really do have to foster, reach out to businesses, talk to them, but also be aggressively uh, pursuing some of the major players. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Pope, for sharing all that with us. Let's go to Mr. Orleans, Mr. Orleans. Uh, we're talking about the needs of the business community and what we can do to help. Uh, if you're still there, sir, can you share your thoughts with us? I'm here. Uh, in any discussion of economic development, it should always be asked in whose interest are we developing uh, our economy? Uh, the ownership of Greenway Center's interest are not Greenbelt residents' interest? If so, when it was first suggested the Greenway Center's owners 10 or 12 years ago that they allow for a bus stop internal to their uh, property or at least a connection, a pedestrian connection internal to their property rather than uh, uh, that lawn which exists, which in winter is inaccessible, they would have agreed. But they wouldn't even agree to that. Uh, their interests are not Greenbelt's interests. If a quantum were, uh, interests were related more to Greenbelt's interests, they would be, have been more forthcoming much earlier in agreeing to redevelop its property uh, in, with an, an inclusion of an affordable housing element. It chose not to do so. If their interests were Greenbelt's interests, they would have suffered their economic loss without coming to the taxpayers of Greenbelt through the city council to get uh, reimbursed for their failed uh, uh, business model uh, to the tune of several hundred thousand dollars over several years. Uh, Roosevelt Center's interests certainly are Greenbelt's interests, but Mr. Christakis's interests are not Greenbelt's interests. Council has never been willing to hold Mr. Christakis accountable for the shoddy uh, condition that- Thank you, uh, Thank he you Mr. Orleans. For his Thank you very much for sharing that with us. Uh, uh, Mr. Roberts, your thoughts, please. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, for 22 years, I've been a part of that business community. I've been self a self-employed uh, business owner for 22 years now, and it's been a struggle. Uh, but the one thing I know is that most businesses, uh, they want to go to communities that are good communities. That's the most important thing, uh, that you have a uh, stable uh, housing, that you have a beautiful city makes a big difference, that you have, you know, uh, low crime in your, in your community. All those kinds of things that are our job to do is what we need to do. We need to allow the business people to do their job and we need to do our job and make sure that our city is a livable, beautiful city that people want to come to. That's my biggest, uh, that's my opinion. And I, you know, I've got 22 years experience to know how hard it is uh, to be in business. And uh, so, you know, I can, I can work with people uh, in business and, uh, and I can work with the city to make sure that our city uh, stays a beautiful and a livable city. And that's the most important thing I believe. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. We return now to Mr. Gordon as we uh, talk about the, the business community here. Sir, your thoughts? Yes, yeah, sir. So first, I just want to agree with the sentiments. Um, Ms. Liggins is doing a fantastic job, obviously, with, with, with the rough times we've been in. She's done a great job of working with our businesses. I will say that we need to highlight the situation, the, the, such the positive. Greenbelt is such a unique city. And I think we need to have a robust marketing campaign by utilizing not just our business development department, along with Green Access Television, uh, which I'm so, I'm glad I get a chance to serve as uh, the vice president of Gate because we're always serving for content. There's so much content that can be used with using marketing to put Greenman out there and also using those relationships again on the county level to actually bring the Access Television in 
again, to show folks that Greenbelt, you can live here, you can work here, you can play here. And just a kind of matter of tagline, that you can come into our city and you can live here and enjoy all the, the things and all the amenities that we have here and still get that hometown feel. So I think a marketing campaign, robust marketing campaign, along with our businesses, working with our business development department, as well as that robust through social media, because as you know, I'm a huge social media guy. So social media would be a big part of that. And again, I do like the, the, the actual thing as far as having ads, which is a great idea, using social media ads, having paid ads for businesses as well. That way that's more economics coming into the city. So if someone was still like, hey, I want to pay for this ad through, you know, through this, through, through this organization, we say, hey, we can use this, we use these funds for our city. But I do believe that marketing is the best way to go with this. Thank you for all those suggestions, Mr. Gordon. And let's move now to Mr. Jordan. Mr. Jordan, your thoughts on what we can do for the business community here in Greenbelt. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you. We, we, we need to build better relationships with our business community. Council uh, too often in the past has sort of taken an adversarial stance with our business community when they come before council. Uh, when the question comes up, whose interest are, is, is the business community? It's everyone's interest because to the extent that our business community thrives, that, that means that we will not have to rely on personal property taxes, personal taxes as much. So we, we need the business community. We're all in this together. You know, our office vacancy rate remains high. It's a regional problem throughout the uh, Washington, D.C. area. Now, close to eight years ago, you know, I led counsel to commission a study from Anuban Basu, one of the leading economists in the state of Maryland, and he specifically made some recommendations about our office vacancy rate. He suggested that we needed to develop incentives to help, help them redevelop. Our offices are, are becoming older, our office complexes uh, throughout the city. And there's a lot of competition. You know, the nature of work is changing. So, you know, that maybe a lot of companies and organizations will not need as much uh, office space. So we need to be proactive about this. And uh, relationships with the business community is something I've been committed to my entire time on council. You know, I shepherded, I initiated those business coffees that we have. I shepherded in the hiring of our economic development staff. So we need to keep our eye on the ball because, you know, the residential and business community, you can't separate, you can't have one with the, without the other. We really need to focus on the business community and have a better relationship so we can work together. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Weaver, you get the last word on this topic. Yeah, it's hard to go last because a lot of the things I, I, I had thoughts on are similar, but I guess maybe that's a good sign that whichever seven of us are elected to council, there's, there, there are clearly some things we agree on. Uh, what I was going to say is I think uh, one of the ways to, to uh, build the, 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 is to build relationships with prospective businesses so they feel they have a partner with, partnership with us towards mutual go goals. A key mo mover of that, as has been mentioned, is the, uh, the economic development coordinator in her office. But I do think it's worth thinking about that thoughtful and focused development may mean trying to attract businesses that fill an unfilled niche, and especially those that support the cooperative and environmental ethos of the city. Um, I think the, the recent example of the, the, the shared office space that's being, that's being renovated in, in uh, Roosevelt Center is an excellent example of that. Um, and I think also in specific instances, the city may be able to serve as a bridge between uh, the business and, and the county or state resources and requirements. For example, facilitating events for food trucks or other pop-up businesses. Um, and I think this has also been mentioned, we should talk to the people who have businesses in Greenbelt about why they came and stayed, as well as I think just as importantly, those who considered coming to Greenbelt but didn't, because they're going to be best able to tell us about the barriers and problems they faced and why they chose to locate their business elsewhere. So I think getting more information from the people um, who, who, who can tell us what to do better um, is really important. Thank you, Ms. Weaver. Uh, before we have all of you return with your final statements, we have one final question for you to, can't, for you to answer. Uh, we end with an equity question that has been much in the news and one that all voters will see on the ballot. The referendum question asks if the City Council of Greenbelt should establish a 21 member council to review, discuss, and make recommendations related to local reparations for African American and Native American residents of Greenbelt. Voters will be asked to indicate yes or no to establish the commission. So, our last question we are asking each council candidate 
what is your position on the referendum question regarding reparations? And we'll start with uh, Mr. Inzio, please. Yes, sir. One thing that I've realized is that I've noticed door knocking, that there's a lot of pain. I've noticed that. And, and there's a lot of conflicting. And one thing, one, thing that I, one thing that I'm concerned about this referendum is that it is very decisive. One thing that I've learned in watching the meetings is that the council is, is, is extremely divided when it comes to this issue. So one thing that I, that, I, that, I, that I am open to is I'm open to learning. I think that's the most important thing. I'm open to, uh, to listening. And, I'm, and, I'm, and, and I think that's the most important thing. Uh, I'm, I'm open also to, to listen to the vote um, and, and, and hearing the voices from the, from the city. And I think, uh, and then also hearing from all the council members. And I think that's the most important thing before making a, a decision in reference like this. Uh, I, also, I also know that there's a lot of pain and, uh, and I think the importance is, is learning from the history and moving forward and making Greenville better in the future. Thank you. We appreciate you weighing in. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Jordan, please. Yeah, thank you very much. You know, I, I recognize and appreciate the case for reparations. That's, that's why I did support putting on the ballot. I'm gonna listen to the uh, people on this. Personally, I, I'm more supportive of a broader equity and inclusion task force so we can have these conversations and other conversations around equity and inclusion. And I did uh, bring that up. You know, uh, Greenbelt was founded in 1937 and owned and operated by the federal government uh, up until the mid 50s when GHI was formed. So I, I think when you talk about reparations, I think the focus needs to be on Prince George's County, the federal government and the state. Uh, so that's, uh, that's how I feel about it. I'm gonna listen to the people. I did uh, support putting it on the ballot, but I, I think we need to have a broader conversation. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Bird, your ideas. Yes, uh, I support uh, the, and I, and I voted yes on, well, I will be voting yes on it. Um, and, and, and let me just say, I also will listen to the people. Um, you know, if there's strong opposition to this, I'll, I'll take that into consideration, but I support this because uh, regardless, uh, the reality is um, there, there is a case to be made for it. Um, not just at the federal level, not just at the state level, not just at the county level, uh, but right here in Greenbelt, um, you know, unfortunately, our, our city is not immune to the uh, unfortunate disease of, of, of green. Uh, I'm sorry, of uh, of racism, um, and and it and in part, it has some of the vestiges of of Jim Crow. When you think about geographical segregation that we've seen, um, you know, in different parts of the city, I mean, that's just that's just a fact, right? Um, and so I support it, um, and I also want to say that. The answer to this question is important because if the, the commission is voted favorably upon by the voters in this referendum, the people of Greenbelt and particularly those who might be uh, impacted by this question. Uh, many of our residents who are residents of color, African-Americans and particular Native Americans, um, they're really gonna have to ask themselves, is, are the people who ultimately win, are they going to take very seriously that outcome? And are they going to implement and act upon it? And then as far as diversity and equity, I, I propose funding for an, a director of diversity, equity, inclusion for the budget that was rejected by several of the members. Of the, Thank, as, you. As, Thank as, you very as, much, as, Mr. Burt. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Davis, uh, your thoughts. Well, I voted to put the question before our voters and our residents, and that is because I want to hear what they have to think. We certainly heard a lot from individuals, but now we need to hear from the entire city. Uh, and I'm willing to abide by the results of that referendum, uh, no matter which way it goes. However, if the question fails to reach a majority vote, I will continue my efforts to eliminate disparities and inequities in city services and policies, as I have always done throughout my 28 years on council. There are many times that it's sometimes it's an education process. Um, someone needs to tell us what the problem is, and then we realize you know, we need to see all sides of the issue. And that included, for instance, our festival of lights uh, that we always thought was the way we should be done. 
However, uh, people said, no, that's not the way it should be done. There are many, many diverse, diverse religions in our city and di different viewpoints. So a couple of years ago, the Community Relations Advisory Board and the Rec Recreation Department changed things around. And now it's come back again because our, our population has become even more diverse. And so we need to welcome all ideas and all traditions and viewpoints. It strengthens our community and makes it much more enjoyable to learn about other people in the way that they uh, handle their holidays, their food, uh, just the way that they deal with each other. Uh, uh, culture is a great thing. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Davis. Let's go now to uh, Ms. Weaver, please. We're talking about the referendum question. Yes, thank you. Um, I think it's past time for this type of conversation as our society is coming to a cultural reckoning about the darker aspects of American history. It's a national issue, but also does have specific implications in Greenbelt because of our own local history of exclusion in the early days of the city. And the concept of reparations is not just about monetary compensation, although that may be part of it. It's also about acknowledging the misdeeds of the past and accepting responsibility for them in a restorative justice sense. And for those, especially my fellow white folks who try to say things like, I wasn't there, I wasn't even alive yet, why is it up to me to address this and potentially have to pay for reparations? Yes, it would have been better if the inequalities had been addressed in, by previous generations or better yet not perpetrated in the first place. But until someone invents a time machine, the only time we have to work with is now. And it's time to stop kicking the can down the road to future generations and start dealing with it. Um, because even if I wasn't there, I am benefiting from the circumstances created by injustices done to others. And so I will be voting in favor of the referenda referendum and look forward to, to uh, hearing what the rest of the community has to say about it. Thank you, Ms. Weaver. Mr. Orleans, you are our next uh... Panelist, uh, would you tell us your thoughts, please? Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Uh, I support the question. I will be voting for it. I am urging others to vote for it. I do think, however, that a 21 member commission is an unfortunate element of the question. I think council, along with such in the community as Gila, the faith community, the business community, if they really have the interests of Greenbelt at heart. We should all be engaged in this question on a continuing basis. Uh, how to overcome the errors of our collective past is something that we all should be involved with. Uh, however, I will be voting yes on the question. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Gordon, your thoughts, please. Thank you so much, Mrs. Zane. So the beautiful thing about learning in your past and looking back, you know, seeing all the great things that were accomplished, but sometimes you look back and you see things that should not have happened. And you learn from those things. You build upon those things to grow for the future. I support reparations as far as the measure and having the conversation. I voted early, so I did vote for it. I'll put that out there right now. Because I believe the conversation is necessary. It needs to be had. And I want to accept whatever comes back from that committee, no matter which way it goes. But the conversation needs to be had. For example, I'll use a quick story. I had a bully once in school, always beat me up. And I was told my grandmother, if you have that conversation, say, you know what? This is why you are hurting me. And this is what it is doing to me. They can understand, you can learn from each other, learn from the pain and the hurt that was caused, that way it's not replicated again. And you can build upon that, upon a common ground. And that's what conversation does. To get in the room and say, hey, this is what I went through. And you can understand. Because people can say one thing, but you have to listen and be open to listen to the pain and hurt. That's how you build upon a common ground. So that being said, I support the conversation as a whole because it is needed now. We appreciate that, Mr. Gordon. Uh, Mr. Roberts, it's time for your say. Thank you, I appreciate it. I assume you can hear me now. Yes, sir. yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Well, you know, it's my opinion that we're doing this backwards and we're doing it backwards because unfortunately, four of my colleagues refused to vote on the first, on doing it right. 
it, it's the first time in the history of the city council that four people have refused to vote on an issue and that's a, a violation of our, our rules. But what we should have done is we should have had the commission so that we can have a conversation because a conversation is the most important part of this. So we should have had the commission and then they should have come out with some recommendations and then maybe we should have considered having a referendum. If we didn't like the recommendations and there's controversy, then we should have had the referendum and allow, allow the people to have their say, should there be any kind of reparations or not. Instead, we're doing it backwards. You know, we're telling people to vote to have uh, essentially a committee or a commission. That's, uh, you know, that's not really giving the citizens any say in the issue and they should have a say in the issue. So that's where I stand. We're doing it backwards, but we're gonna have to go that way. We're gonna have to uh, you know, vote on this and I'm sure we're gonna, we'll probably will have the commission and then we need to have that conversation. Because like I said, the conversation is the most important thing because our country is, is fraught uh, with all kinds of bad things that no one wants to talk about. Yes, sir. You can't solve your Thank issue. you so much for sharing all that with us, Thank Mr. You. Roberts. And the last word on the referendum question uh, goes to you, Ms. Pope. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, Greenbelt did not um, originally allow Black people to become residents when the town was built in 1937. I do strongly support the historical awareness of this racism that occurred over 80 years ago so that it will never happen again, and especially not here in our city. However, I don't think it's with the scope of our city government to address and solve any national or state level issues of systemic racism, segregation, and discrimination. When Greenbelt was built in 1937, the land was owned by the federal government. And I strongly believe that if anyone should research and spearhead this issue, it should be the federal government and not our current Greenbelt residents. We are a small municipality of about 23,000 residents. The city's income comes from property taxes that our residents and property owners pay. I don't think we simply do not have the financial means or the manpower to do the in-depth research that is necessary to thoroughly investigate this injustice. Um, I am not saying yes, I'm not saying no, but I think that that is, we, we're getting ahead of ourselves and maybe we are doing this backwards. Um, and I think this question, we could have had this committee and not put it on the referendum. We should just vote on it. But of course, if the committee is formed, I am, I am optimistic and I'm sure I'm going to work with the committee and listen. And of Thank course, um, work with everyone involved. Thank you very Absolutely. much, Ms. Pope. Um, all of you watching now know an awful lot more about our candidates running for city council um, have responded to the questions, uh, many of which probably are on your mind as well. It is now time for them to present their final thoughts, whatever they would like to say, and each one of our candidates will get one minute to wrap up uh, on this evening. Um, of uh, enlightenment and education. Let's start with uh, closing remarks. One minute from Ms. Weaver, please. Well, I wanna thank all of the folks who organized this event for giving us all the opportunity to, to speak to the community. Um, I, I think it's really important to be able to, uh, to know what your potential elected fish, officials uh, think about different issues. Um, I, I'm sorry, that I wish it could have been more of a conversation. Um, I think that's, that's what would be, uh, it, it, was, it was us talking at you. And so what I would, 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 would uh, encourage all of the Greenbelt voters listening is to, to reach out for more conversation and a little bit more back and forth. Um, watch the news review uh, this week for, for uh, information about a meet and greet with me on Saturday. But mostly I just thank everybody for, for staying tuned in on this Tuesday evening and for, um, for being engaged in your, in your civic life and, and please vote on November 2nd. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weaver, for joining us this evening. 
Uh, Mr. Jordan, your one minute summation, please, sir. Hey, uh, thank you. I've heard a lot of good ideas this evening and I compliment my fellow candidates on their thoughts. And uh, if I'm fortunate enough to be elected to council, I look forward to uh, working with, with uh, each of you, you know, on, on some of the issues raised tonight. My, my service on council since 2009 provides some reasons why voters should reconsider my reelection. You know, I take pride in being prepared for meetings. Uh, I, I actively debate issues and frequently ask questions put forward uh, by staff, other council members, hard questions. I strive to be respectful of differing opinions and trying to work for a consensus on issues, even when I disagree. And uh, you know, I provide measured practical leadership on council during my time. So a lot of the issues that I've advocated for are just now taking hold, but much remains to be done. Uh, I'll just wrap it up there and say that uh, I respectfully ask for your votes so I continue to work on your behalf. If you want more information or if you're interested in volunteering or getting involved with my campaign, just go to my website, jordanforgreenbelt.org. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Mr. Orleans, your final thoughts this evening. You have one minute, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, some folks, I think, uh, like the status quo just fine. And I believe without knowing just why they do so. Uh, some of us want to change it. I want to change it, uh, especially in how we think. Why is it that we believe it, what it is that we believe? And can we justify it? Uh, sincerity, I think, is the most important quality in anybody seeking elective office. Uh, I'm not going to speak in platitudes. Uh, uh, whatever I believe should be a different course on policy questions. The only reason that I'm standing for council is to help improve the practice of democracy in Greenbelt. Uh, I'm familiar with council. It talks too much. It should listen more. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Orleans. Uh, Ms. Pope, the final thoughts you'd like to leave with the voters this evening. Thank you so much. Um, I'm ready to continue to work with all of um, council members, with all the council members that are going to be reelected or newly elected, if I'm lucky enough to be back on council. Um, I'm ready to work collaboratively with all of my colleagues. I'll work diligently. I'm trying to bring civility back to our meetings, treat everyone with respect, listen carefully, and of course, disagree respectfully at times. Um, I would say let's get together as a team because to get, we need to work together to get things done. Um, teamwork makes the dream work. That's the saying. Um, I kindly ask for your vote during this election. You'll find my name on number seven this time on the ballot. And I certainly thank you very much for hosting this forum. And I really want you to know I'm dedicated to working for Greenbelt just as hard as I've been in the past. And I look forward to another two years, hopefully, fingers crossed. Thank you very much, Ms. Pope, for being here with us tonight. Mr. Bird, your closing remarks. So again, I want to emphasize that um, I have experience, but I also have fresh ideas. I have energy and I have the youth uh, that, that brings about an urgency when it comes to getting things done. And that is what I've tried to spend the last two years doing. I have never missed a vote as a member of the city council. I have passed many many pieces of legislation, uh, many motions. I have held more town halls than any council member in city history over a two year period. I have engaged hand in hand with constituents on constituent services. Um, I listen, I communicate via email, I communicate via social media. Um, but I also wanna let you know that I've grown. I'm not perfect. I've made mistakes. Uh, you know, FDR said, there's nothing I love as much as a good fight. And, you know, there's some of that in me, but I've also learned the importance of collaboration. I've learned, learned the importance of relationships, but most of all, what you'll get from me is being straightforward with you and never being afraid to fight for the people of Greenbelt. Thank you, Mr. Bird. Mr. Inzio, uh, your turn to address the voters. Your final thoughts tonight. Yes, sir. I just want to say thank you first. Um, you know, I've always, I've always saw myself as a Greenbelt man. I've lived here almost 30 years. My very first job was I was a lifeguard at Aquatic Fitness Center, and, and I've always stayed here. And I've been loyal to Greenbelt. I love Greenbelt. I raised my family here, all four of my lovely four children. I got married in Greenbelt. 
I stayed in Greenbelt. I believe in Greenbelt. And I just ask that when you make your seven votes, you think about me. Thank you and God bless. Thank you, Mr. Inzio. Uh, Ms. Davis, the floor is yours. Well, I'd like to thank Ms. Lambert and all the people who put this event together, this candidate forum. It's the only one in the whole, the whole uh, election. Over my 28 years on council and having leadership roles on regional, state, and county levels, I have gained the experience, skills, knowledge necessary to work with my colleagues and to do what's best for Greenbelt. And over those 28 years, I have learned a lot and sometimes I have changed and for the better, I hope. I do not have any aspirations for higher office. I have been honored to serve the people of my hometown in as many ways as I can. And I will continue to ask the necessary questions, do the necessary research to listen to our constituents and to work toward productive consensus on council if I am reelected. I have been and always will be committed to community. I will appreciate your support and your vote. Thank you very, very much. We appreciate all your comments, Ms. Davis. Uh, Mr. Roberts, your turn. One Thank last you. Thank you. I appreciate give it. your thoughts. Well, I know it's a big ask after being on council for 30 years to ask to be reelected again. But the reason that I'm running again this year is because I have some real unfinished business. And the most important issue that I want to pursue is a new park for the people in Greenbelt West because the, the children of Greenbelt West for the past four years have been cheated, they've been discriminated against because they have not got uh, the same kind of resources that the rest of our city has. Old Greenbelt is loaded with parks and playgrounds and playing fields. Uh, Greenbelt East has its fair share of those things. The people in Greenbelt West have none of that. The children over there cannot walk down the street and play, you know, a sport on a team uh, like the kids in our side of town can. And I want to remedy that. I want to make that right. And that's a big issue. The other thing I want to do is I want to secure the armory facility for our uh, volunteer fire department. Thank so you. They can, thank you, thank you, you know, very much, Mr. Roberts, for, for your you. final comments there. And Mr. Gordon, the last candidate thoughts of the night are yours, sir. I want to thank uh, Ms. Lambert and her team for putting this together. Mrs. Aaron, it's always a pleasure. Uh, you definitely shaped my childhood as a student of Prince George's County Public Schools in the Science Bowl. Thank you. With that being said, I just want folks to realize and understand that for me, this is almost a three decade journey of helping and serving my community. I began at the age of 10 from lessons from my grandmother about creating common grounds, creating solutions finding answers to problems by working with others. It's good to find common ground. When you find common ground, it helps you see the perspective of others. That way you learn from them and they learn you. I'm about common ground solutions and working with our city to move Greenbelt forward for the future and honoring our past and helping our seniors and educating our children and all the above. So I thank you so much for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. And thank all of you. Thank all of you for participating tonight. Thank all of you that have tuned in. And of course, we all hope that you vote. Uh, voting is ongoing at the moment. And here to tell you more about voting and where to do it and when you can do it is uh, the reason I'm here tonight is because of this woman, uh, Dina Lambert. Uh, I've likened her to Gwen Eiffel. She has the <laughs> same personality and work ethic. She is indefatigable and you wanna work for her because she cares so much. And Phoebe, who is beside the, behind the scenes here at Gate, she's been making me look good and sound good all night here. What a, what a talent she is at well. So I thank you all for your attention and Dina, it's up to you now. Oh, thank you so much, Mrs. Aaron. This this has definitely been uh, an event for the season. I, I think um, based on the comments I'm seeing on Facebook and, and I'm sure as a small town as we are, we'll be talking about this for some time. So um, I wanna thank each one of you who uh, attended our candidates who um, set aside time, 
who prepared thoughtful comments for this evening. Um, it, it takes a lot of work and this is uh, definitely not a sprint, but a marathon, um, not just until election day, but even afterwards, because um, the people that you heard from this evening, uh, they uh, share their passions and it sounds as though they are in it for the long haul. So uh, given that this is just one conversation, I wanna encourage um, you as listeners, as residents, as neighbors, to continue the conversations uh, within yourself, within your family, uh, but also with the candidates. Many of them have websites, uh, many of them have social media pages. So please reach out to them, ask them the questions, and you know, give consideration to each of them, because certainly we all know that our future depends on uh, the leaders that we have on our council and their ability to work together and collaboration uh, with our stakeholders in the county and state. So finally, um, as far as the big day, uh, we have early voting. Our last chance for early voting is this coming Saturday and Sunday at uh, the Spring Hill Lake Recreation Center. Uh, I believe it's 9 a.m. until 11, um, but please check the Greenbelt uh, website for more information on Saturday and Sunday early voting. Then we have our big day on November the 2nd. Um, please give thoughtful consideration to all of the elements that are on uh, the ballot. Um, please, if you have any kind of feedback uh, for this forum, please follow up uh, with me at vicepresident at ghi.coop, C-O-O-P, and I'll be happy to respond uh, as I'm able to. I really want to take a moment to uh, thank Mr. Dave Zarin, who was our wonderful moderator for this evening. Um, our timekeeper, Mr. Ben Wilhelm, he's definitely kept us on track. Um, also, our interpreters, Steve and Laura, um, who have provided access for our deaf and hard of hearing community, um, as well as the team. Um, they have been behind the scenes with me, giving me wisdom, guidance, thoughtfulness. Um, that includes Phoebe McFarb from Gate, Dr. Lois Rosado from uh, Charleston um, Village Condominiums, uh, Bob Zugby, and um, Ben Wilhelm and Conrad Hurling. If I'm missing anyone, please tax it to my heart. But I want to thank you so much for this evening and have a good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night, Mr. Nabert, and uh, next week. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Please. Bye. Good night, all.